So let's get started. Let's kind of motivate the need for a sound power measurement. So if we we're to measure the sound, let's say we've got a loud speaker here and your boss might come up to you and say, I want you to measure how loud this loudspeaker is. So you might take a regular microphone and measure the sound pressure at a location around that speaker, but we run into an issue when we do that. Depending on the location of this microphone, whether or not it's one meter away from the speaker or two meters away from the speaker, we get a different sound pressure level measurement. So the measured sound pressure level of the speaker is dependent on where we place this microphone with respect to the speaker. So the closer the microphone to the speaker, the higher the sound pressure level will measure. This can be a kind of a challenge. Let's say you have a, a target that you're trying to meet. Say you exceed the target, you can't just you know, move the microphone further away, record a lower sound pressure level and say, hey, I now meet my sound pressure level target. You know, with just measuring sound pressure with the microphone, we have to be a little careful about where we are placing our measurement equipment. Both the distance from the speaker matters and uh, the location of the microphone. So we could place a, an additional microphone, let's say a meter behind our loudspeaker now. And because the speaker is very directive, it's emitting sound very strongly in a particular direction, this microphone behind the speaker will read a uh, much lower sound pressure level than the microphone in front of the speaker. And so in order to quantify the strength of this loudspeaker, we need a different metric other than sound pressure. And so just to sum up, when we measure the sound level of an object, sound pressure readings are dependent on both the location uh, of the microphone and the distance away from the sound source. Sound power is a quantity that attempts to quantify the acoustic source strength of an object independent of the distance and location of the measurement. So a, a good kind of analogy for sound power is let's take a look at an electric heater. So this heater is going to emit heat and that heat is going to increase the temperature of the, uh, of the room that the heater is in. That temperature is analogous to sound pressure. So if this was a, a speaker instead of a heater, that speaker would emit sound and that sound uh, or that emitted sound is going to cause a sound pressure throughout this room. Now, a heater has a rated power typically in watts. So if you went to Home Depot to buy a heater, you might buy something like a 200 watt heater. Now that wattage is you know, not the same as the, the temperature increase that you would see in that room, but it's a measure of how much energy that heater puts out. And that's what sound power is. So the, the power that this heater puts out is analogous to the sound power a speaker might emit. So sound power, uh, let's talk about why it's important and how it's used a little bit. Sound power is a characteristic property of an acoustic source. So we can use it kind of as a, I'll call it a, an independent metric. It's independent of the location of a particular microphone. It's also independent of, of where that microphone is placed. So it gives us a characteristic source strength, which makes it a lot easier for us to compare two objects, for example. Uh, instead of just comparing a sound pressure level uh, measurement, which might be dependent on microphone position and how close or far it is from the object, we can compare the sound powers of the two objects and uh, have greater confidence in our comparison. Sound power has widespread recognition across many different industries, from you know heavy equipment to home goods like uh, dishwashers, vacuum cleaners, kitchen, uh, even uh, the, the ventilation hoods. People will all measure and report the sound power values of those types of items. It only depends on the noise source and is independent of the uh, acoustic environment of the product. Uh, the sound power level is defined so this L sub W stands for the sound power level as 10 times the log base 10 of the measured sound power 
W here divided by a reference sound power, where the reference acoustic power is 10 to the negative 12 watts. So this is the common sound power reference, and I should have mentioned this is the sound power level in decibels. So this is the, the conversion here to a, a dB format. So why compute sound power? You might compute sound power to comply with legislation. So, for example, in the European Union, it's common to have limits on particular specific products. If that product has a sound power level that's too high, uh, it is not allowed to sell that product within the European Union. Uh, you might perform a sound power measurement because you have to. Uh, sound power is also a really nice measurement for uh, comparing with either a version of your product or with a uh, competitive product to do benchmarking. And that kind of also folds in here with just it's a good uh, metric during the uh, engineering development cycle. You can use it for things like setting targets. I'd like to have a, you know, for example, a drill that has a, a sound power level below a specific value. Sound power is also uh, sometimes used kind of an end of line test. Um, so once, uh, you know, maybe a vehicle is rolling off the production line, you do a quick sound power test uh, in order to make sure that that vehicle was manufactured correctly and that everything is within the vehicle tolerances. Uh, and just like there's a lot of reasons, many people do perform sound power tests. So it's a very applicable type of test across a really wide range of products. So from things that are actually very loud, uh, heavy construction equipment, you know, these uh, big ships, very large, uh, loud diesel engines, uh, to smaller household products. So both machine tools and uh, office equipment. So it's not uncommon to see different printers or copiers with sound power labels. Typically, there's two families of ways that sound power is calculated. On the left here, we show pressure-based sound power, where we would measure uh, a certain number of microphones surrounding the test object. We would then uh, kind of do some averaging amongst those microphones and kind of control for the uh, surface area of our chosen hemisphere and the way that we can configure the microphones and we would come up with a, a sound power level. Uh, the result of this method is uh, a label like the one show here where we have LWA, which stands for the A-weighted sound power level, and then the, the level, a uh, single number of 104 dB. And so this sticker would, you know, depending on why you're doing the sound power testing, it might be put on the box where the product is sold, um, so displayed to the consumer or sent to a government regulator. We also have sound power based on sound intensity, um, where we measure the sound pressure using an intensity probe and then based on our sound intensity measurement, we can get a sound power level. So now we're going to go into a little more detail on the actual sound power calculation. And we're going to talk first about the sound power based on sound pressure. And specifically, we're going to talk about ISO 3744. So in ISO 3744, uh, ideally you're either measuring in a uh, anechoic room or if you're measuring something that will be commonly used outside, say a, a lawn mower or a, maybe a snowmobile, uh, you can measure this outdoors as well. So in this standard, we place a number of microphones around the test object, typically either in a hemisphere or in what we would call a parallel pipette. And the, uh, the number of microphones is dependent on how large the test object is and also how directive that test object is. So is all of the sound coming from the front of the test object or is it relatively evenly dispersed around the object? This pressure-based sound power is, is a nice standard and it's a nice measurement method because it's typically pretty fast and easy. Uh, once you get your uh, measurement surface set up, it's very quick to go ahead and perform measurements or multiple measurements. 
that's kind of downside is it does need to be performed in a controlled environment. So it does require an acoustic chamber or a good quiet place outdoors uh, in order to do your testing. And kind of the end result here is we get a overall sound power level. And we can also obtain the sound power uh, in one third octave bands. Showing here is the sound power equation. Basically what we're doing is we're taking the average pressure uh, from each of our microphones that are dispersed around the test object. So that's this term right here. We optionally can perform some correction factors for the test environment. So there's a correction factor for background noise. If there's a lot of background noise during the measurement, say your test chamber maybe has a kind of a noisy HVAC system, that will add to the overall sound power level of your product. Um, and so we can perform some measurements to try and account for that background noise level and subtract it out of our measurement. Typically, when you're using this correction, the source must still be at least 6 dB above the background in each one-third octave band, and it's recommended that you're at least 15 dB above the, the background noise. Uh, there's also a correction for the test environment. So uh, let's say very extreme example would be if you were testing a lawnmower um, in a anechoic chamber and in a reverberant room, the reverberant room test would obviously have a much higher sound power level, the level of noise will be much greater. Um, so there's a correction factor for the test environment. Now, practically, uh, if uh, you're doing a sound power level measurement that specifies that you perform the measurement in an anechoic chamber, you probably shouldn't be performing the measurement in a reverb room. And then finally, we have this last term here, this 10 times the log of S over S naught, which is a uh, surface area term. And this term here is the key to how we account for the, the distance and the location of our measurement microphones, which I'll illustrate uh, on this next slide here. So the way uh, the sound power measurement works, and this is ignoring those K1 and K2 correction factors, is we measure the average sound power level on our surface and the area of our surface. And we add those two together to get our overall sound power level. And so let's say for this particular speaker, I've got a hemisphere around which I've placed some microphones. I measure the average sound pressure and this surface area. So this S over S naught. And I get 100 dB. If I move my microphones back, and I create a wider hemisphere, and I perform the same measurement, my average sound pressure is going to drop because the microphones are further away from the speaker. However, the surface area is increasing. And the surface area increase and the average sound pressure drop offset each other, and I still get the same sound power level. And so this sound power number is independent of how close or how far I place my microphones away from this speaker. By accounting for both the average sound pressure and the surface area, I'm able to arrive at this independent characterization of the speaker. So let's talk a little bit about some of the regulations and standards concerning sound power. The, the European Union is a really big driver behind you know, many of these sound power standards, and a big reason for that is a, a series of directives, things like these human vibration directives, a noise at work directive, and a noise emission directive, which basically set sound power level targets under which a, a product must be below in order to be sold in the European Union, or they might just require a product to be labeled. So the product doesn't need to be below a particular target, uh, but it must be labeled with a sound power level value uh, in order to be sold. And these are uh, mostly aimed at you know protecting uh, the hearing of people at work um, and in uh, just the home environment. 
So there's a hierarchy of sound power standards kind of starting at the top here. Well, maybe I'll, I'll advance these and we can look at them all at once. So we've got some very broad standards at the top here. They might indicate things like who needs to measure sound power. So a particular product, an industry, they might indicate for a particular object, what does the operating condition of the test need to be? So an example that I like to give is that there are standards for printers, for example. They must be printing a particular number of pages per minute. You know, it might indicate whether or not it needs to use a color cartridge or a black and white cart uh, cartridge and so on. And there are other standards for different equipment like earth moving machinery, uh, lawn mowers, and so on. So that's kind of the top level of uh, standards. These next set of standards uh, go into detail on how the actual measurement is performed. So there might be a standard, let's say ECMA 74, which tells you what the operating condition of the particular product needs to be. And then something like ISO 3744 would tell you things like how exactly is the sound power level calculated? Where do my microphones need to be placed? Do I need to include any correction for environmental factors like background noise or for the test environment? Uh, and what is a acceptable uh, precision between particular measurements? Um, is a, you know, something like uh, if I take two sound power measurements, is a one dB difference between those sound power level measurements acceptable? Does it need to be lower? Can it be higher? And so on. And then finally, there are uh, individual standards on the measurement equipment. So things like what microphones can be used, what kind of analyzers can be used, what set of octave band standards are allowable, and so on. So there's quite a few different standards that are used here, just both starting from, you know, what kind of product are you testing to how are you actually going to perform the measurement. So when you're performing a sound power test, it's often important to keep this in mind.